Breast reconstruction is an option available to all women diagnosed with breast cancer, and there are many types of reconstruction options. Breast reconstruction is about more than physical appearance. Many women who have had reconstruction can speak to the fact that it made them feel whole again, which carries tremendous benefits for both mental and emotional health, just as we heard Carol speak about earlier. At this time, I'd like to call to the podium Dr. Michael Dobransky. Dr. Dobransky will be moderating a panel discussion with his peers on innovations in breast reconstruction. Dr. Dobransky is a partner at Long Island Plastic Surgical Group. He obtained his medical degree and general surgery residency at NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Dobransky then went into the prestigious Cleveland Clinic where he completed a plastic surgery residency and a postgraduate fellowship in aesthetic surgery. He is certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Doctor, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and for coming, and thank you again, Kristen, for hosting. Excuse me. I will, in the interest of time, skip the introduction of my esteemed colleagues because I will probably take thir the full 30 minutes that we're allotted to just introduce their credentials. Uh, but it is available in the brochure that you guys will have. Dr. Douglas, I'm going to start with you. Um, lately, a lot of press has been given to something called ALCL, Bre Breast Implant Associated ALCL. Could you tell us about what it means and what are the symptoms and, if anything, what is there to be done about it? This, this is an, enti <clears throat> an entity. It's an anaplastic large cell lymphoma that appears to be causally linked to biofilms that develop around textured, not so much smooth, but textured implants. It is a rare occurrence with statistics of approximately one in 30,000 instances. Uh, there have been in the world approximately 570 cases that have been documented, and there's ways of determining how this presents and how to document it. Would you like specifics, uh, Michael? Yes, please. So how does this present? This rare entity presents anywhere from one to eight, but 20 years, usually about eight years after an augmentation or breast reconstruction with a textured implant where the patient will have a unilateral sudden swelling, which usually is a seroma. Now this could be a totally innocent seroma, but if this occurs, it has to be worked up where under sonographic guidance, there would be needle aspiration of the fluid which would be sent for certain immunochemical studies, uh, flow cytometry, cytology, et cetera, to determine whether, in fact, there are cells that are identifiable as this anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Thank you. What about uh, the treatments for the implants themselves? Is there an indication for removal? So if there is a documentation of ALCL, it is usually, in most cases, just fixed to the biofilm and the capsule, which is immediately around the implant. The treatment in almost all cases is an open capsulectomy, meaning that you are removing the implant, obviously, and the entire mesothelial capsule with the involvement. Now, in certain rare cases, there has been lymph node involvement and even metastases. Uh, worldwide, there have actually been 16 recorded deaths that have been linked to this, but it is still a very, very, very rare occurrence. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. I'll, I would like to also maybe add, if you don't mind, that the deaths that have been linked with this have all been late diagnoses, where diagnosis was delayed for more than a year of symptoms, and uh, they have all been systemic involvements, and the patients have not received the appropriate recommended therapy. So it, it, this is a treatable disease. Yes, it can be a fatal disease, but this is a treatable disease. I think one more thing to add that's important is that people that have these implants, there is no need to panic, and the, the recommendation is not that everyone that has a textured implant have it removed. It is only if a seroma, a unilateral symptomatology develops where further workup is required. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Dr. Kilgo, um, what is new in implant-based reconstruction? So there have been several developments um, in both technique 
and technology that when combined have allowed us to uh, create a more natural looking and uh, feeling reconstructed breasts. The, the long-standing criticism of implant breast reconstruction is that the breasts simply just look like implants. And with the widespread acceptance of skin sparing mastectomies and the, and the increasing popularity of nipple sparing procedures, you know, it's become incumbent upon us as plastic surgeons to really fill out the skin envelope that the breast surgeon leaves behind to, to restore the, the natural breast shape. So uh, I'll start out by talking about fat grafting, which is something we've talked about on this panel before, but it's really revolutionized breast implant reconstruction in my opinion. It's a simple procedure where we're taking fat from one part of the body, purifying it, injecting it into the reconstructed breasts in areas where you might have a contour regularity or a thin, a thin area. Um, and that serves to improve the shape of the breast and also to thicken the flap so that the, the reconstruction is more uh, living tissue than implant or has more living tissue um, uh, than, uh, um, as well as an implant. But it, it, it lessens our, uh, the dependence on the reconstruction on the shape of the implant to create the eventual shape of the breast. Um, so in speaking about implants, that's, that's the next subject. Um, there have been significant increases in implant technology. Um, and we have more implants available to us today to choose from than we ever have had in the past. And I'm particularly fond of the newer, uh, highly cohesive gels. Some people call them gummy bear implants um, that, are, that are slightly filled to a higher capacity than, than they have been in the past. And those go a long way in addressing the issues we had with what's called visibility, wrinkling, rippling. These implants are more cohesive, but they're very, still very soft, and they're much less likely to uh, to ripple and wrinkle, um, which was a real problem with saline implants in the past. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is something called acellular dermal matrices, which are basically, it's a, it's a skin replacement of biologic origin. It's usually human derived, can be come from a cow or, or a pig. Um, they're sterilized and they're, they're put in the reconstructed breast to provide additional structure and support. And historically, we have used them to wrap the lower portion of the implant while the upper portion of the implant is covered with the pectoralis major muscle. But, you know, and the newest development, and I think a very exciting development in implant reconstruction is we're now putting the implant, in some cases, above the muscle and wrapping the entire prosthesis in the, in, in the ADM, which allows us to really maximize our ability to fill that natural skin envelope, again, going back to the natural, natural techniques. Um, so in summary, you know, we've had these developments coupled with, I think, better aesthetic mastectomies um, that have allow, allowed us to evolve from creating a breast that looks like an implant to creating a breast that actually looks like a natural breast. Thank you. So uh, in continuing this discussion, the, there was an article in the New York Times approximately three weeks ago that actually talked about uh, the prepectoral breast reconstruction. Uh, can you delve into, uh, into this a little deeper for us and tell us who the candidates are and how that's, that decision is made? Right. So, so the big advantage of that procedure, and it is sort of the hot topic today in plastic surgery, is it, it all stems from minimizing our manipulation of the pectoralis major muscle. So, so the two big impacts, I think, are that it, it, it decreases postoperative pain. We're not cutting the muscle. We're not elevating the muscle. And that hopefully will translate into decreased use of narcotic pain medication, quicker re recovery times, you know, shorter hospital stays, and potentially, you know, this is a new procedure, so we don't have a lot of long-term data, but potentially that might translate into decreased chronic pain. And the other thing, it's, it's, it's very good at addressing something called um, the animation deformity, which is a very common problem with women who've had implant reconstructions. And it's a, it's a dysfunctional relationship between the muscle and the implant. When the muscle contracts, the implant shifts up and outwards. So the entire reconstructed breast does as well. And the skin over it wrinkles and ripples. And it's a very unnatural look. And it can be quite distressing. But that procedure is um, very effective in eliminating that problem. So in terms of candidates, just to, to, to uh, elaborate a little bit, um, it's probably better to talk about who's not a candidate for it. And patients who may have an issue with wound healing problems um, you know, the reason we put the implant over the, the muscle over the implant traditionally was to protect the implant from wound healing issues, infection, infection of the implant, and, and reconstructive failure. So patients who have very thin mastectomy flaps that, that don't have a good blood supply, uh, poorly controlled diabetics, smokers, patients who have been radiated would probably be better serve with a more traditional technique. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Dr. Natoli, uh, would you please give us the latest updates in breast reconstruction, uh, flap planning and design, free flap planning and design? Yeah, 
Yeah, so to talk a little bit about autologous reconstruction, which is basically when we use the patient's own tissue to reconstruct the breast, there's, there's nothing, I would say, this year per, per se that's revolutionary. However, we're getting better at the techniques that we use and the planning in general. Um, it's very common to use a CAT scan ahead of these procedures to map out where we take the blood vessels from. So um, the most common type of autologous reconstruction that we use as breast surgeons is from the tummy uh, deep inferior epigastric perforator flap which is kind of the evolution of what used to be called the tram flap when we would take the uh, patient's muscle as well. And kind of like what Dr. Kilgo was saying, the downside of using the muscle was it really weakened uh, on, on different levels, but it, it put the uh, muscle in an unnatural position and caused patients to have a lot of abdominal and core weakness as a result of the surgery. So with time, as microsurgery has developed, we've been better at dissecting into the belly and preserving the muscle and just taking the blood vessel with the overlying tissue, the fat of the tummy, and the overlying skin. And as our technology and radiology techniques have improved, we've been able to really target the um, better blood vessels. So even though with a standard deep flap, we're using the same blood vessel, the anatomical variations between patients vary. And what we've learned as we've continued to study and prove on what we do is that depending on where we get those perforators, whether they're from more of the central part of the abdomen or the lateral part of the abdomen, we could see a higher rate in abdominal hernias and bulges after when we're taking them laterally. However, those uh, perforators tend to give a patient a more robust blood supply. So things that have um, kind of plagued uh, perhaps the re reconstructed patient after having a little fat that didn't do well, that didn't have a good blood supply, and it can present as like a little cystic lesion or even as a mass in a patient that had previously had breast cancer is always distressful. So as we do these preoperative scans to really improve and target upon the blood vessels we're using, we're able to really select uh, for um, better perfusion. Um, and even though I would still say that the mainstay of our autologous reconstruction is, tends to be from the tummy, that's the, the um, main donor site that we use, there's many alternatives. Tug flaps are from the inner thigh. Um, S-gap and I-gap flaps are different acronyms for using the buttock fat. There is newer alternatives as well that have, uh, that have come up in the last couple of years. A pap flap is from the posterior thigh in someone that doesn't have enough tissue from their belly as well. Um, and this has been a nice alternative to using the buttock tissue because if, if someone were to grab their buttock and then grab their tummy, the tummy fat is a lot softer and it feels a lot more like a supple soft breast than the buttock does, which tends to be a little firmer because we're sitting on it all the time. So the posterior thigh flap has been a nice alternative. And in terms of sur surgical procedure, we're able to do that with the posi patient positioned on their back, so it uh, decreases operative time as well. Thank you. Uh, what about pain? What about post-operative pain? Uh, are there any developments in terms of pain management for these patients? Yeah. So I would say we're looking at, you know, really ways to improve what we do, even though it may be the same procedure. Um, and a nice targeted approach has been working with the anesthesiologist using targeted blocks. So a transverse abdominis a plane block is a, or called a tap block is basically a procedure that can be done with ultrasound guidance, um, injecting a long-acting anesthetic at the time of the surgery. So often when we're harvesting the abdominal muscle, we're able to basically d deposit a long-acting um, anesthetic into the plane where the muscle is harvested from and where that dissection really takes place to decrease the amount of time the patient spends in the hospital. So with these deep reconstructions, if we put it, um, the ones that have been put on protocol in study have shown that, especially with the obese patient, because their, their pain scores have tended to be higher, um, that their length of stay in the hospital is almost a day shorter using these blocks um, as a standard fashion. And we've really been able, especially with the narcotic epidemic in the country, to decrease the amount of narcotics these patients are taking postoperatively. And you know, a lot of these patients are young patients that are doing bilateral uh, prophylactic surgeries that are going home to kids, and we certainly don't want to give them another problem, narcotic you know, dependency after, which is a, re a real problem in, in these big surgeries. Thank you. Um, one of the previous speakers mentioned uh, lymphedema, being measured for lymphedema, actually. Uh, could you maybe elaborate on uh, the updates in terms of the role of microsurgery in treating lymphedema, should that happen? 
Sure. So lymphedema is a problem that you know we have, and, and less so today with less ag aggressive and more targeted uh, axillary node dissections, but, but still a problem for patients when they have it. We are good at um, helping to alleviate the, the symptoms of lymphedema and helping to improve it. However, we certainly there's no cure for it at this point. So in terms of new techniques and, and improving techniques in microsurgery, what, um, there's really two mainstays. One is lean, um, sorry, lymphovenous bypass uh, procedures, and the other is vascularized lymph node transfer. And these have been used for years, however, um, with more of the use of lymphocentigraphy um, and using the endocyanine dye to kind of target the um, um, lymphatic system, we're able to, with the lymphovenous bypass, to really um, map out the lymphatics ahead of time. And basically what we're looking for is very, very tiny uh, lymphatics under the surface to attach them to basically venules, little veins under the surface. Um, and it's, they call it super microsurgery because the um, lumens are less than a millimeter in, in size, so it's, it's done under the microscope. And by targeting specifically where we know these lymphatics are uh, more robust, we're able to divert some more of that interstitial, that lymphatic fluid that accumulates in the upper extremities. And it can happen in the lower extremity too, but specifically with axillary dissections happens in the upper extremity. So that's one technique. Um, that's better for patients with stage one and stage two lymphedema. In the more severe patients, sometimes that's coupled or um, in a patient that needs a breast reconstruction that's having a delayed reconstruction, then to actually transfer lymph, uh, vascularized lymph nodes at the same time as transferring the belly tissue with the deep procedure, we're able to target those lymphatics, uh, the lymph nodes in the groin and literally bring them and um, bring new lymphatics to the axilla and improve the lymphedema that way. So the techniques, you know, we're refining them certainly with these improvements in microsurgery um, and seeing real results, although a cure is, you know, at, at this time still eluded us. Thank you. Uh, I'll open the floor to questions for the panel. Yes. and do the transplant at the time of the deep flap? Absolutely, and that's what we try to achieve when we can. So in patients, if, if you guys didn't hear at the beginning of the question, in patients who are seeking to have a deep flap or a tram flap, do you do the lymph node transfers at the same time? So that's, that's the best indication for it in patients that are having a delayed reconstruction. Or in patients of mine, I've also done it for patients that have had an implant reconstruction and ended up needing radiation and had problems and developed lymphedema. And we go to try to, um, you know, basically alter their reconstruction by giving them autolog autologous reconstruction. We plan and map out doing the lymphatic procedure at the same time that we do the deep reconstruction or tissue transfer. And, and some people do have it just on, you know, Patients who are satisfied or don't want a breast reconstruction but are really plagued by the lymphedema and that's really affecting their quality of life, they have these you know, vascularized lymph node transfers alone for treatment that can be successful as well. Thank you. I just want to add a comment. Um, I think we all touched upon very different topics in breast reconstruction and, and what's going on today. However, so much of what we do and what we all do is, is overlapped. So in microsurgery, when we're treating patients, I have patients all the time that I use fat grafting for or patients that sometimes, you know, also need implants. Uh, and so there's a lot of overlap between these different techniques and they really work well in conjunction. Um, I do myself a lot of secondary breast reconstruction and revisions in patients that maybe had a reconstruction 10 years ago and are looking for, they're just not happy with their result. And, they tend to be very hesitant to come in and, and, and complain about it because they're just happy that, you know, they're alive and they're a survivor. However, there's a lot that we can offer with these newer techniques that Dr. Kilgo spoke about. So, you know, a patient that every time she wears a low-cut dress, her breast is jumping up, we can change those pockets and those are things that are still covered by insurance and adding a little fat to an area that, you know, has chronically bothered a patient for years and years and it's, it's 
really never too late. Thank you, panel. At this time, I'd like to introduce Jerry Barish. Jerry has been at the forefront of the battle against breast cancer on Long Island since 1988 and has earned the distinction of being New York State's preeminent breast cancer activist. As president of One in Nine, Jerry has spearheaded negotiations of the New York State's pesticide registry law, which created an accessible database to determine whether there is a relationship between pesticide use and breast cancer. Jerry. So today, I am extremely excited to be here, to be here because to talk about 20 years ago, the opening of Hewlett House. I found a speech that I had written on October 22nd, 1998, and um, I'd like to read it to you because it's very apropos, especially of what we as women, um, not to offend any gentlemen here, um, have accomplished what we do and then I'll bring you up to date a little bit on this incredible journey that I myself have been through. October 23rd, 1998. Over two centuries ago, the Hewlett family built this incredible house where we stand today. As I think about that era, I think of the women who were dressed as I am today, which was the period of time. And who, it is safe to say, did much of the work of making this homestead a happy and successful place. Whether they were churning the milk to make butter, making the family clothes, or raising the children, then like now, the roles of caretaker, nurturer, homemaker, and laborer were invariably filled by them. Life wasn't always easy. It was a struggle to balance all these tasks, to fulfill so many responsibilities. Naturally, the women of the 18th century were successful susceptible to ill health and disease, and some no doubt were unknowingly, unknowingly victims of breast cancer, which has existed in some form for centuries. Today, notwithstanding the enormous gains women have made socially and economically, we still tend to fill the multiple roles our ancestors did. And despite the amazing developments in science and medicine that have marked the industrial age, we have seen, particularly in the past 20 years or so, breast cancer become an epidemic that is ravaging women around the world, particularly in our Long Island community. And as you know, I've been fortunate enough to survive this disease. Others have not been so lucky. As a survivor, I believe I have no choice to engage in a struggle, a struggle not only to continue surviving, but to learn new skills and fulfill new roles as an advocate, an organizer, an agitator, and an educator. Together with all of my colleagues, with the extraordinary commitment of our community of supporters in business and politics, with our friends and neighbors, we have used these skills raising money and awareness, fighting for a cure, and looking for the causes, wherever it may lead, of breast cancer. We leave no stone unturned, we make no compromises, we take no prisoners because we are on a mission. And now with our partners in the Nassau County Legislature, we have a new weapon in our arsenal, Hewlett House, the first free-to-all comprehensive breast cancer education and resource center in the nation. 12 months a year, seven days a week, we will be here to address the concerns of breast cancer survivors and patients, their families and friends, whether it is counseling, information, or therapy, or yoga, or simply a place to relax and have a cup of coffee. Hewlett House will be their home away from home. And it is this environment that we will take our struggle to the next level, which of course is victory. So imbued with the spirit of our forebearers today, we dedicate this wonderful place, this house of hope, this memorial to life, to those who have died and those who have survived, but most importantly, to those generations who are not yet with us, but who we are determined to keep free from this disease. Ultimately, I envision Hewlett House as a museum a treatment, a testament to struggle, a testament to commitment, but no longer needed as a weapon in the battle because victory will be ours. Well, victory is not there yet. We still have a long way to go. I'm a five-time cancer survivor, and Hewlett House has truly been there for me. Each time I was diagnosed, I jumped in my car 
and ran back to that house knowing all of the survivors who run the programs, the doctor who's on board with us, the patients, are there to give me a hug and support. Because even though I'm the executive director and run it, I still have my emotions and my fears like everyone else. The incredible thing about this home, and some of you I know have been there, the wig program, the bras, the prosthetics, the counseling, the support groups, just hanging out, the gardens, the art center. I could go on and on and on and on, but this is about hope and love and hugs. From the pet therapy programs to watching somebody come in and say, where do I go? I have no place to go. Will you have a home? And that's what it's about. To all the doctors in the hospitals that we work with that come into our doors, to my own doctors at South Nassau who keep me going, I have to tell you, we have the best right here in Long Island. To the Long Island Plastics, who I have to say, made my husband a new man, God bless you. Um, we are, and that's from his cheek and his ear, so no ideas. But we certainly have the very best here. We have incredible places to go. I invite you to come and see what we do. To see those knitters in there and crocheters making those, those little animals to give out to the children. Because now we do all cancer. And when you see them come in, and when you see groups of men and women that whether they have cancer on their head, on their toe, it doesn't matter because we're all in this fight together. Um, I can't thank you enough for allowing me, uh, Lisa and Janine, to talk about Hewlett House, our 20th anniversary. We have seen just under 29,000 people that we have serviced, all at no charge. So, if you haven't been there, Come and see us. Come and visit. It's quite a place. I'm very, very proud. Thank you. We actually want to bring Jerry back up. We have a special announcement and a special visitor with us here. Senator Todd Kaminsky is here today and has a special honor for Jerry. Jerry, where'd you go? No. Did she leave? No, Jerry. Anyone here on behalf of Jerry? Anyone? Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Senator, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know how that... Oh, oh well. Anyway. Okay. So I'm uh, fortunate enough to represent Jerry, and uh, I, th I think uh, Jerry and I have had this conversation privately, and I'll share it with her again, but certainly... Um, so many people's lives have been made better because Jerry is, is in their lives. And on the 20th anniversary of Hewlett House, we just thought it was so important to recognize the great work she does, does so many different things for people in a, in a very difficult time, and she's just been a tremendous asset to the community. Uh, so I just wanted to let her know that the, the Senate appreciates her, the people of the state of New York appreciates her, and the official state record of New York will now reflect on the 20th anniversary of Hewlett House, how important she is, and it states that uh, Jerry Bowers is the lifeblood of our community. Her work so often goes unrecognized and unheralded, but we officially recognize Jerry Barish as an individual worthy of her highest respect and esteem. Keep up the good work. I'll just quickly say on behalf of Jerry Barish, who is an incredible woman, the Hewlett House is also incredible. What a nice place for people to gather. Please go see it, um, and I will definitely deliver this to her. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have our guest of honor and keynote speaker, Dee Dee Ricks. Dee Dee Ricks is an entrepreneur, public health advocate, and expert on patient navigation. D.D. was living the dream as a high-powered hedge fund consultant with two children until breast cancer changed her world. Ricks underwent a double mastectomy and chemotherapy to treat her aggressive cancer, followed by breast reconstruction surgery. 
Ms. Rick's story was shared with the world in the HBO documentary, The Education of Dee Dee Ricks. The documentary followed Dee Dee in her journey from diagnosis to survivorship and the many challenges and hardships she endured along the way, including learning about low health literacy in underserved communities, becoming deeply passionate to end injustice in healthcare accessibility, and the drive to make patient navigation a household name. Dee Dee views health as a human right and has committed her life to make people aware of the healthcare resources to which they are entitled. She often says that cancer is the worst and the best thing that ever happened to her. Please join me in welcoming Dee Dee Ricks. Good afternoon. I um, want to start off by saying it's okay to hate that woman in the beginning. I know I do. Every time I see that trailer, I cringe. Um, but uh, that's why we're here today, is to really hear how I went from that spoiled, awful brat um, to the ever-evolving survivor that I am today. Um, today's discussion is really based upon the art of survival. So I basically put together um, my favorite quotes in terms of all the keys that go into what I call creating this masterpiece of surviving. Uh, I found this one quote, and once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure, in fact, whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain. When you come out of that storm, you won't be the same person that walked in. I've learned that surviving is not innate, that it's actually a learned art. Uh, there's many moments that I've gone through in my life, and uh, my history has been somewhat interesting from the standpoint of it's not been the normal. Um, that most people experience when they're growing up. I left home at six, um, moved in with my aunt, uncles, and then uh, eventually at 13, moved in with my best friend, started working full-time at Chick-fil-A, uh, and then I had this dream that I wanted to go to college. And I had my sight set on University of Florida. It was University of Florida or nothing. And I got in, uh, barely and uh, spent four years there, and it was the first time I ever felt like I had a home. Um, despite the hard work and the academics, uh, you know, it was really a place where I found myself. Um, I graduated from University of Florida and moved to New York City without knowing a soul. Um, I still to this day think, why did I do that? Uh, but three years into it, um, I started my own hedge fund consulting company at the ripe old age of 24. Over the past 26 years, I've had incredibly good fortune. Um, I am probably one of the luckiest women alive on many fronts. But even through all of my success and even some of my hardships, nothing could have possibly prepared me for what was about to come. So let's fast forward. I've left University of Florida. I've come up to New York. I have this great business. It's 2007. I'm running a multi-million dollar business in the hedge fund industry. Um, I have two beautiful baby boys um, that were two and a half and six. I was a single mom and I thought I had everything. And then I heard these words, you have cancer and the left breast must come off immediately. Like anyone that hears this diagnosis, I was you know, stunned. 
So I'm thinking, what do I do? My sons are babies. So I started filming moments with them, such as reading the book, I'll Love You Forever, going to the park with them, having dinner with them, anything, so they would have these moments if I were to die. And then one day, my life changed forever. I now know that if you're lucky enough, you're going to have this quote unquote aha moment. And I found this quote, um, a moment's insight is sometimes worth a lifetime or life's experiences. And that statement could not be further from the truth as it pertains to my history. A week after my double mastectomy, I walk into the Ralph Lauren Cancer Center in Harlem and I meet Dr. Harold P. Freeman. And he says these words to me, poverty should not be an offense that is punishable by death. Now I went to University of Florida, I'm thinking, whoa, what is that again? Um, you're going to have to repeat that for me. So, you know, we, we went over it and we discussed what it really meant, you know, poverty should not be an offense that is punishable by death. My life changed that day because when you're diagnosed with this deadly disease, you begin to reevaluate your life. I hadn't yet moved the needle in helping others, nor did I believe that I had yet created a legacy that would have left my sons proud of me if I were to die. I was still that spoiled brat. And I knew that it was no longer about just me and my sons. I had the power to go out there and affect other lives. Dr. Freeman taught me that, and it was my responsibility to go out there and be the role model and help others to see that there's 100 million Americans in our country that are dying and don't have access to health care. This brings me to my next key of a masterpiece, which is giving. Survival is a privilege which entails obligations. I am forever asking myself what I can do for those who have not survived. So, you know, I'm you know, going through all of this. Um, you know, I began my chemotherapy. That moment that I met Dr. Freeman, um, very much in my usual DD way, I'm like, I'm going to raise you two and a half million dollars in our first meeting. And it, it, he's shocked. He's like, what do you mean? Uh, and I made this commitment to him, and I'm in the process of chemotherapy, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm doing all of this to give back and to help others. I'm trying to raise my kids, and I'm trying also to run my business to help others. My physician said, don't do this. You need to focus on your health. You have to be there for your boys. But something, and I don't know if it was my past when I was a little girl, you just keep going. And I realized that I didn't want to be that self-centered person anymore. So my focus became working with women who were underinsured or uninsured and helping them get access to treatment. Uh, the next one, vulnerability. Never be ashamed of a scar. It simply means you were stronger than when it ever tried to hurt you. The documentary was a very difficult decision for me to make. It exposed um, some of the most intimate moments of my journey. You see the scene where I say goodbye to my breast. You see the next scene where I look at myself in the mirror after my breast had been cut off. Keeps going, watch my process with reconstruction and what I go through, my chemotherapy, and my son's reaction to my disease. HBO shocked me. I saw the film for the first time, and I'm sitting there, and there was this moment where I, I'm so proud. I, my hair was all straggly, and so I'd shaved it off. And so I go in, and I pull my wig off, and I have a clean shaven head, and I'm thinking I'm doing this great thing. I walk out of the room, they catch on camera, and they say to my oldest son, what did you think? And he shook his head, and he's like, no, it was awful. So you don't realize sometimes, you know, when you're caught up in the moment, what these little kids are thinking in their minds, and I'm going through, and I'm seeing everything that I expose my children to. You talk about vulnerability and being raw and exposing yourself, but there's a reason that I chose to do this. 
I knew that my life could be an example for others and that my vulnerability in showing what you're going to go through could be an example that you can get through this and that it's okay for your children to see you suffer. Education. Once you stop learning, you start dying. So many people have asked me about the documentary in terms of what was the purpose of it. If you, if you watch the documentary, it's a story about me as a white successful woman and what I go through fighting cancer versus Cynthia who was African American and uninsured. It's a story about two different women from two different backgrounds who become dear friends. You see, Cynthia was young, vivacious, just like me. The only difference between the two of us is that I was white and rich, and she was poor and black. There was no other difference between us. So we follow her treatment, and then tragically, her death. When I met Cynthia, I did not believe that this is the way the story was going to end. You know, she was so incredible. Cynthia wasn't given her constitutional right to live. This happens way too often in this country now when you were stage four or underinsured. I knew, and I made her a promise, that this was going to change and that we were going to go out there and fight for women that had what she had and that didn't have access and that couldn't get the medical treatment that they needed. So how was I going to do this? And you talk about the education. My education came from Dr. Freeman. He discovered years ago that treating the underserved community wasn't actually an issue of making sure they got the medicine, although that's a part of it. The larger obstacle went to actually making sure that they could overcome barriers. What does that mean? It means maybe they can't get to treatment because they can't afford the subway to get there. They can't afford gas. They can't afford babysitting services for their kids. Who's going to take care of their kids? So they skip treatment. Maybe they can't even speak the language and communicate to their doctor how they're feeling. All of these barriers, they became known as, and overcoming these barriers and having timely access to care became known as patient navigation. Patient navigation stresses timely access. Cynthia was diagnosed three years after she discovered her lump. No one wanted to treat her because she was uninsured. Determination. It's not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. I think that when you think about determination, uh, I realize that my life has been um, very fortunate. Um, I often look at what we've done, and I realize that my life is and my destiny is saving lives, very much like mine has been saved. You know, many people say, hey, you, you, this is all you focus on, and you know, don't you ever get tired of it? And I do. Come on, we've all had those moments where you just don't want to get out of bed. So I do the stupid things like recollect quotes from Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in this world. That helps me to get my bed or, you know, my butt out of bed and do at least one thing that day, which contributes to giving back to saving a life or helping those most in need. Strength. You never know how strong you are until your choice, your, until being strong is your only choice. This photo um, is a very poignant photo for me. It was the first time as a cancer patient um, and three weeks into my chemotherapy that um, I ever did a public speaking engagement. We were in LA, and we all know how vain and much everyone uh, focuses on your looks there. And 
you saw me with my long blonde Paris Hilton wig. I'm like, if I have to have a wig on, I'm going to really go for something that I would never wear and, and look like in my normal life. So I'm walking out on stage, and everyone's like, oh, God, here comes another bimbo. I knew, and I'd never, ever taken my wig off in public, but I knew that if I didn't take my wig off, there's no way anyone would have listened to me. There was over 2,000 people in that crowd that night. So this is my first moment. You could have heard a pin drop that night. I realized that despite being a single woman and in my past being completely consumed with what I look like, that my destiny now was to use my illness and my um, physical appearance to help others cope. So right now, um, I want to, because I know that you guys have been sitting for a long day, I, I just want to do this one little exercise. If you've had a moment in your life where you have been giving back, it could be volunteering, it could be um, starting a foundation, whatever it might be, um, and you realized, whether it be that night or two months down, two years down, that what you were doing actually helped you more than the people that you were helping. If you've had that moment, just stand up. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's... Um, it's a very, go ahead, you guys can sit down. I'm very impressed that you see so many. This, the process that I've been through and all of the um, keys that we've gone over, um, strength, um, determination, aha moments, that all happened really during the period of the documentary. And that was what I would like to call phase one of the education of Dee Dee Ricks. And most people think, okay, it's done, it's over with, you've told your story, enough lady. We're moving on to stage two of my life. And what everything that I went through was about to prepare me for the biggest battle of my life. So, you know, you talk about thankfulness and the importance of appreciating where you are. There's one thing that I've honed in with my sons is never ever take for granted what you have. We are very fortunate and it is your job and your obligation to pay it forward. My sons are incredible in that they are very generous, very loving, they are very accepting, but I really didn't understand the um, severity of how much that they were affected from the documentary. So. You see these photos up here of um, kids in hockey uh, uniforms. My sons are avid hockey players. And I'm watching my older son play uh, his first game where he's allowed to hit. And so he's allowed to check. He plays defense. So I watch him send a kid over the boards. And I'm thinking, where did this violence come from? That's my gentle giant, not my baby. And then all the negative thoughts started coming in. I've screwed up my kids. I, I've, I've exposed them to too much. He's feeling the effects of everything that we've gone through. I never really thought what they went through as children. I drag them to Congress to testify. I put them on Good Morning America. I mean, they were just exposed to the world as much as I was. And it was starting to dawn on me that maybe this wasn't a good thing for them. And I always wondered, did they remember Cynthia? And this is an aha moment. I sit in the car with him. It's hard to even tell the story. And I said, John, John, what happened there? I've never seen that side of you. He goes, Mom, they called LJ the N-word. I lost it because I knew then and there that my sons cared about social justice my kids, I was a good example for my boys. And then from then on, everyone knows there's no diversity in hockey. And I knew that what I needed to do was to give back in their world and something that they understood. So we started the Next Gen AAA Foundation. And what we do is we go out there and very talented kids that cannot afford to play the sport. It's $15,000 a year, and that's cheap. 
but there are some kids out there that could really go to the next level. So we created this foundation. Four years later, I'm proud to say that we've raised over 800, and when I say we, I mean me and my boys. They have not missed an event. They've been to every practice. They are in there with all of these kids. We have 264 student athletes now, part of our program, boys and girls, um, from all different types of backgrounds. Um, we have given away this year alone $183,000 in scholarship. We were able to get $164,000 of scholarships you know, awarded to from the schools. And we're changing these kids' lives and we're giving them a better life. I asked you earlier to stand up if something you have done has made your life better. Love. There is a land of the living and then the land of the dead, and the bridge is love, the only survival, the only meaning. You're going to notice in these photos that there's three boys. Well, welcome and meet my third son, Dante. Dante was a part of NextGen in the very beginning. I don't know how it happened. If in the beginning, it was two nights staying over, and then three nights, and then four nights, and then, well, what are you doing this weekend? Well, we're doing X. Well, can I go? Ultimately, you know, over the four-year period, um, I, Financially, I've taken Dante on. I'm spending $60,000 a year to send him to one of the top prep schools in the country. He has a 97 GPA. Uh, he got a 96 on the PSAT. He's slated to go to Colgate University on a D1 commitment. I'm very, very proud of my work with Dante, but I am even more happy that I've been able to get this kid and my sons have another brother, and that they don't see color. We've really bonded as a family. And I, I, this Christmas, it's one of the funniest stories. Dante comes in. My kids are with their um, father. We're divorced. And it's just he and I. And it's Christmas Eve. And I'm like, let's watch It's a Wonderful Life. And he's like, no, let's watch Tyler Perry's Christmas Media. <laughs> and, 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 and he's like, Hashtag, oh, no, she didn't. And I'm like, wait a minute, okay. All right, so let's settle. You know, we're going to compromise here. Um, let's watch National Lapoon's Christmas Vacation. He goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, you haven't ever seen Chevy Chase and the movies and Vacation. So we ended up watching it. And then afterwards, I mean, the whole time he's just shaking his head. And I'm like, well, what did you think? He goes, Didi, that Clark, he is a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, um, Dante has really filled our lives, and I'll explain a little bit more about filling our lives in just a second. Forgiveness. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. You see two photos here. I think um, I talked earlier about my quote unquote unusual childhood. Um, the first photo is my mother and I. Um, I finally went to go see her. Um, she's riddled with Alzheimer's. Um, we clearly did not have a relationship. I never really had that mother in my life. Unfortunately, I realized too late that you know everything that I've gone through, I knew that I, something still wasn't right with me. And I knew that I had to let go of this anger and this resentment. And so, you know, I went to visit my mom, and it was too late. She didn't, she didn't get it. But I think that, you know, for me, it was, it was a healthy exercise. Um, however, my father, who's below, um, is crazy as coot, um, but he is um, my dad. And we have rekindled our relationship, and this is a photo taken in April at his 80th birthday party. I bring this up about forgiveness because I know in order to truly heal and really have that ever-evolving survivor, you need to get rid of the anger inside or the hurt. And then as I started to think positively about my parents, I realized something. I actually had great parents. 
And you're probably thinking, what do you mean they left you? Well, I am who I am today, and I'm as strong as I am today because my parents weren't there to say no. I don't know no. I don't know what it's like for someone to say, oh, don't go ride your bike, you might get hurt. So in some ways, I owe my parents a great deal because they gave me the, the basis to be whom I am today. Fearlessness. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And um, the better part of Franklin D. Roosevelt was his wife. You gain straight courage and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You see munificent asset management here. And um, I, I'm, I'm sharing this with you today, and I'll try to make this story short uh, as we try to wind down here. But um, I decided in 2015 that I was going to compete and try to build my own hedge fund. After all, I've done it for every other billionaire out there. I've built some of the best hedge funds in the world, so I'm like, I can do this for myself. So I went out and I started my own hedge fund, and three months into it, I was diagnosed with cancer again. This time it was stage three melanoma. So right as I'm going through one of the hardest things I've ever done, I was clearly out of my league. This was something I had never done, but I, I knew that I never wanted to be that girl that said, I should have, or I, I wish I would have taken that chance. And I can look myself in the mirror every day and say, you did it, but you failed. But let's talk about failure. I might not have raised a billion dollars, but Munificent became a seeding fund for healthcare technologies. My first investment, which I funded personally. My first investment returned seven times. My second, 30 times my initial investment. And I'm currently spending about... 70% of my time now working on a technology that was developed by NASA. And uh, it's a technology that does two things. First and foremost is disease detection. We're working with Johns Hopkins University and we're, we're doing a, a, a trial where you can breathe into d the technology and it detects the biomarkers and it can detect stage one lung cancer. Everyone knows that if you detect lung cancer, it's almost 99% curable if found at stage zero or one. Now, all of a sudden, this company that I started is now, I'm able to use the technology and my background to be able to give back and to save lives. You heard me mention the toughest battle of my life earlier. The other technology that we're, the technology that we're using this for is also in addition to disease detection for drug detection. So we are able to, um, marijuana, opioids, uh, Xanax, so on and so forth. I bring this up because um, my son suffered three concussions from hockey and we went through a lot as a family, but he turned to marijuana and he turned to Xanax. In six months, I watched my baby boy completely fall apart. I'll never forget the night that I got the call and I went to the hospital, he had overdosed. And I, I'm looking and he's got this empty stare to him and I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get my kid back. I'm proud to say that the next day, my son checked himself into rehab. This was in September of last year. He's worked really, really hard to come back. I am so, so, I, I can't even believe I'm telling this because it was just such a nightmare. He's in an outpatient program. He's been clean and sober now for almost eight months. He's got a straight A average now this year in school, and we're finally seeing the light of day with everything that he went through. So, you know, you talk about saving lives, and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm watching my own child go through the most horrific experience of his life, 
And now I'm working on this technology that has the ability to detect the um, uh, consummation of, of horrible drugs such as Xanax and opioids. And you realize what's happening in our country today. And while most people in the hedge fund industry would say that I failed, I didn't. I was able to turn my career into something where yet again I'm doing what I do best, which is saving and helping lives, including my own sons. Carpe diem. In the end of the day, we only regret the chances we didn't take. And I always listen to this song the first time I was ever diagnosed. And he said someday, I hope you get the chance to live like you are dying. You know, this past year, I haven't been able to think outside of my sons. Um, you know, I've been all consumed with making sure that all of us got on the right path. And I turned 50 in April, and I was supposed to go to India, and I made the choice not to go because I couldn't leave my kids. Two weeks ago, my girlfriend called me, and things are, things are good, knock on wood. And she's like, Daddy's having his 90th birthday next week, come. So in two days, I got my visa, I packed up, and I got on the plane, and I'm like, how did that all happen? And I realized that as a survivor, we have to take those moments, and we have to go out there and carpe diem and seize the day. India was a life-changing experience for me. Not only did I see how impoverished the company was, um, I was also exposed to the seven wonders of the world, the Taj Mahal. But on the last day, I went to um, Temple with Nima. And you go through, and they're like, we have to cover your head. I'm like, OK, no problem. And then you need to be barefoot. Now, all of you are like, OK, what's the big deal about being barefoot? When I was diagnosed with melanoma, um, it was my toe. And we amputated my toe. And I had this thing that I was just so insecure about the way my foot looked. I could have both of my breasts cut off, show the whole entire world, but I'm so embarrassed to show my four toes. And I'm sitting in temple, there, the praying's going on, the banging of this, I think it was the most insane experience of crying because I realized yet again I've made it out on the other side. And I'm thanking God, and then I look down and I look at my foot. And for the first time ever, I wasn't thinking, oh my God, I, I look deformed. It was, oh my God, I'm so lucky. So carpe diem is a very important part about creating this masterpiece and creating this beautiful life and realizing that you can live your life after going through traumatic experiences. Remember. No matter how far you go in life, never forget where you came from. Um, this is a photo of my Aunt Peggy. Uh, Aunt Peg really helped to raise me. I grew up in Tennessee at one point, and um, uh, she was very integral at a certain point in my life. Well, Aunt Peg was also uh, diagnosed with cancer in 1994, and she had a mastectomy, and she was prescribed six chemo treatments, and she just did three. In her typical um, Texas and Tennessee way, she looks at me and she goes, I'm done. No, no one's touching me, and that's the end of that. So I go to see her um, when I went to go see my mom, because they were in the same area. And Aunt Peg also has Alzheimer's. And I'm so depressed, because I'm looking at my mom, and I'm thinking, this is, this is my future. Alzheimer's just destroys you. And then I'm going to go see my Aunt Peg, who also has it. And I just remember Aunt Peg as being this vivacious, this incredibly funny, outgoing woman. And I walk in, and I'm expecting to see a woman like my mom. And she doesn't recognize me, but that's OK. And I watch her interacting, and they're playing a game. And the game is, you know, 
find ways to say goodbye to each other. Let's recall ways to say goodbye. You know, the residents are going, adios, um, you know, see you later, this, that, and the other. And my Aunt Peg is so bored. And finally she just says, how about get the hell out? <laughs> <laughs> but it hit me that Alzheimer's didn't change her. She was still that fun, loving, incredible survivor that was my role model and that woman that told me you can do anything that you want to do. So I can think of no better way today than to say thank you, Aunt Peg, for being that wonderful role model and that perfect survivor and example for me. Um, thank you so much for all of you for being here today and allowing me to share my story with you. And remember, be the change you wish to see in this world. here and I, I'm like, I can't use this book. Um, so I have no idea what I just talked about. Um, but uh, uh, for those of you that may have questions about um, what I went through, but before we move to that, I, I want to say one thing. My best friend is here with me today. And I've been single and I've been through everything as a single mom. But Leslie, you are my sunshine and thank you for getting me through everything. You're better than any other husband could be. <laughs> I'm a reporter, so I always have questions. The, uh, C Cynthia? Yes. Is I haven't seen the documentary yet. I'd like I'd like to see it. Perhaps I shouldn't ruin it. But is is her death in in, in the documentary? Did yes. it? Fu it yes. is. Yes. It, oh, yeah. yeah. Are you still in touch with her family? Um, I I know her boyfriend um, and her father. That was it. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess I was very thorough in my story. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming today. We're going to have Dee Dee stay up here for a second. Dr. Simpson would like to um, give her something. Thank you for an incredible story, incredibly moving. Thank you. And for your advocacy, selflessness, and your bravery, we would like to present you with this Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, it, 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 it's just incredible how inspiring this has been and for survival for so many people. And the, it's engraved to read the 2018 Breast Cancer Summit presents a Lifetime Achievement Award to Dee Dee Ricks, breast cancer survivor, public health advocate for being an enabler of equality and by navigating for the less fortunate. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Okay. To each of our speakers, we could not be more appreciative of your participation in today's program. Thank you for all the information you have shared with us all today. In addition, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to each of our sponsors for their incredible generosity and dedication to breast health education and awareness. I specifically would like to thank Allergan for their generosity as our presenting sponsor. Thank you as well to K98.3 and Connoisseur Media for helping us spread the word about this event. Once again, if you weren't able to have your question answered, you have the comment card on your table. You just leave the handwriting up and we'll take those from you. On behalf of myself and Long Island Plastic Surgical Group, we hope that you enjoyed today's program and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.